ik heb een fragment gekozen uit het essay On Being Ill. Um, ik heb dat gekozen omdat ik het interessant vind dat Virginia Woolf in dit essay zich afvraagt waarom de thema's van ziek zijn en het lichaam eigenlijk zo onderbelicht zijn gebleven in de literatuur vergeleken met liefde. Want in haar leven is ze heel veel ziek geweest. Dus het is onvermijdelijk dat die ziektes ook haar schrijven hebben beïnvloed. En ik denk, dit essay ja, laat ze eigenlijk zien wat haar gedachten zijn over de relatie tussen schrijven en het lichaam. Considering how common illness is, how tremendous the spiritual change that it brings, how astonishing when the lights of health go down, the undiscovered countries that are then disclosed, what ways and deserts of the soul a slight attack of influenza brings to view, what precipices and lawns sprinkled with bright flowers, a little rise of temperature reveals, what ancient and obdurate oaks are uprooted in us by the act of sickness, how we go down into the pit of death and feel the waters of annihilation close above our heads and wake thinking to find ourselves in the presence of the angels and the harpers. When we have a tooth out and come to the surface in the dentist's armchair and confuse his rinse the mouth, rinse the mouth with the greeting of the deity stooping from the floor of heaven to welcome us. When we think of this, as we are so frequently forced to think of it, it becomes strange indeed that illness has not taken its place with love and battle and jealousy among the prime themes of literature. Novels, one would have thought, would have been devoted to influenza, epic poems to typhoid, odes to pneumonia, lyrics to toothache, but no. With a few exceptions, De Quincey attempted something of the sort in the opium eater, there must be a volume or two about disease scattered through the pages of Proust. Literature does its best to maintain that its concern is with the mind, that the body is a sheet of plain glass through which the soul looks straight and clear and, save for one or two passions such as desire and greed, is null and negligible and non-existent. On the contrary, the very opposite is true. All day, all night, the body intervenes, blunts or sharpens, colors or discolors, turns to wax in the warmth of June, hardens to tallow in the murk of February. The creature within can only gaze through the pain, smudged or rosy. It cannot separate off from the body like the sheath of a knife or the pod of a pea for a single instant. It must go through the whole unending procession of changes, heat and cold, comfort and discomfort, hunger and satisfaction, health and illness, until there comes the inevitable catastrophe. The body smashes itself to smithereens and the soul, it is said, escapes. But all this daily drama of the body, there is no record. People write always of the doings of the mind, the thoughts that come to it, its noble plans, how the mind has civilized the universe. They show it ignoring the body in the philosopher's turret, or kicking the body like an old leather football across leagues of snow and desert in the pursuit of conquest or discovery. Those great wars which the body wages with the mind is slave to it, in the solitude of the bedroom against the assault of fever or the oncome of melancholia are neglected, nor is the reason far to seek. To look these things squarely in the face would need the courage of a lion tamer, a robust philosophy, a reason rooted in the bowels of the earth. Short of these, this monster, the body, this miracle, its pain, will soon make us taper into mysticism or rise with rapid beats of the wings into the raptures of transcendentalism. The public would say that a novel devoted to influenza lacked plot, that they would complain that there was no love in it, wrongly however, for illness often takes on a disguise of love and plays the same odd tricks. It invest, invests certain faces with divinity, sets us to wait hour after hour with pricked ears for the creaking of a stair and wreathe the faces of the absent with a new significance, while the mind concocts a thousand legends and romances about them, for which it has neither time nor taste in health. Finally, to hinder the description of illness in literature, there is the poverty of language. English, which can express the thoughts of Hamlet and the tragedy of Lear, has no words for the shiver and the headache. It has all grown one way. The merest schoolgirl when she falls in love, has Shakespeare or Kate Keats to, sh to speak her mind for her. 
but let a sufferer try to describe a pain in his head to a doctor, and language as at once at once runs dry. There's nothing ready made for him. He is forced to coin words himself, and taking his pain in one hand and a lump of pure sound in the other, as perhaps the people of Babel did in the beginning, so to crush them together that a brand new world word in the end drops out. <laughs>